It's nice to be here with you. I hope you enjoyed Jeff's teaching last week. Uh, he he shared that it seemed like it went really well. He enjoyed teaching and seeing you all. So thanks for supporting him. I hope you found it illuminating. Boy, it's hot. It's hot today, isn't it? So um, what I was thinking about doing, you know, the nature of mind is such a great topic. I'm hovering on it. You know, I don't want to leave it for a while because things that come later are great too. But this is really the juicy part, in my opinion. And there's so much uh, richness to mine here. No need to rush. And, you know, we've been listening, we've been hearing beautiful teachings, but they, and they've all been from men, you know, and there are Tibetan women who have given beautiful nature of mind teachings as well. I don't know why he didn't include them in the book. That's my main issue with the book. Uh, he does include one or two quotes from Machi Glavdran at the very end, having to do with demons. But uh, she taught on way more than than just demons and even Chud, severance practice, which is kind of what she's more well known for. Machi Glavdran is the 11th century Tibetan a woman who was a great practitioner and teacher who founded the uh, the tradition of Chud in the Mahamudra Chud, it's called, in Tibet in the 11th century. She was a contemporary of the great Milarepa, and she's really one of the most famous, well-known women in Tibetan Buddhism. There aren't a lot of them, but there were many women practitioners and teachers and writers, but they didn't have access to the uh, to the kind of platform that the men and the monastics had. So we don't know about them very much. So yeah, the chapter on nature of mind is chapter eleven, and there are some good, couple more good quotes that we can touch on in that. But what I want to do tonight, because Eve can do that next week, but what what I what I can do with you this week is teach on a beautiful poem on the nature of mind by Machi Glavdran that is not in the book. So I have texted it to Mace. I don't know if that's a way that's going to be helpful. I had a hard time uploading it on my computer. I want to share that PDF, PDF with you all of her poem, if possible. Uh, so Mace, if that's possible, great. If, if not, I can maybe... Uh, Wait, sorry, Connor, did you want me to share screen with it? Mm -hmm. Uh, we could do that, or I was hoping Just drop it. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm gonna you... figure it out somehow, everyone. But it's gonna. In... It'll take. You don't have to do it right now. Okay. Because we're gonna meditate, and then oh. I'll give commentary on it. So okay. at some point, over the next hour and a half, if you could help me <laughs> figure out, out yeah. how to get that up to people, okay, cool. uh, we could I'll do it. Best. Worst case scenario, we can share it as a PDF on the YouTube channel, which we've done in the past for the Feeding Your Demons documents if we have to. But ideally, we'll be able to paste it as a PDF download for you in the chat. And if not, we'll share the screen. It's not that long. We'll see. So uh, that's my aspiration. Let's take a moment here to settle in and and arouse our bodhicitta, and then we'll sit for about 30 minutes, so please get comfortable. I will guide us in the, the usual kind of lead-in for our shamatha practice, and then I will read from some of her poem uh, as guidance for you in the meditation, so you'll experience it first in that way, and then we'll unpack it in the discussion after the practice. So settling in. Entering into the meditative mode, whatever position is comfortable for you. Find yourself at ease in it. Make yourself cozy, a little happy place, your island of sanity, however you think of it, however you feel it. This is your time, so really claim it, take your seat. Take some deep breaths down into the abdomen. Relax your whole belt line, the whole circumference of the waist, and release tension with the out breath. Mm -hmm. 
And bringing your hands to prayer or the bodhicitta mudra, if you wish, for the aspiration to awaken for the benefit of all. We are all interconnected. We're not separate. And my liberation is tied up in your liberation. So may we all walk the path together, be of benefit <clears throat> in ways large and small, be patient and kind with ourselves. I saw a beautiful quote by Ram Das today. Of course, he's passed already, but his Instagram <laughs> lives on. And it said something like, my, my one commitment to you is to work on myself. So this is what we're doing through our practice, maintaining that commitment to others by watering the seeds of goodness and joy and patience and compassion and wisdom within ourselves. This is bodhicitta. And if you wish, you can maintain the prayer as if you like, or release the hands to your lap. I appreciate taking a moment here to acknowledge and situate ourselves on the land, and acknowledging and giving thanks to the land and those who have come before us. Acknowledging that the native peoples who've lived on, at least if you're a North American, territory as well as Central and South America, who knows, wherever you're zooming in from around the world. We have different stories, different histories, acknowledging the land, situating ourselves, and also giving thanks to our ancestors. The Tibetans have this built into their prayers that they do before practice, acknowledging the lineage, the teachers, the mentors, the wise ones who've come before. So giving thanks to those beings alive and past. Who've helped us find our way together to this moment now. And We'll shift into the breath awareness, the anapanasati, the mindfulness of the in and the out breath. It's like a returning home to the nourishment of the breath in the moment. You can either feel the breath throughout the whole body, feeling how the sensory stimuli of the breath traveling in and out roots you in your body and the experience of being embodied. And or if you like, you can focus mainly on the belly as a stabilizing, grounding element of your attention, commonly found in the Zen tradition of abdominal, breath, sensory, anchor. Releasing tension with the out-breath. And feeling that quality of being in the moment, at ease within yourself as much as possible. And if there's discomfort or agitation or distraction, that's okay too. Welcome all of that home to you, to the breath.
Sometimes when we notice distraction pulling us away, you can simply cut it loose like a balloon, just letting it go in the sky. The thought of feeling, you can just, rather than trying to control it, just cut it loose and come back to the breath. But then at other times, just some feelings and emotions, they, they want to be actually cradled. They want to be held close. You can even put your hand to your heart if you feel that that helps you bring a piece of yourself back home. Like you would welcoming a, a sad child onto your lap or into your heart space. You can welcome that feeling back in. And let it come home. And then release into meditation again, like, okay, I can solve the problem later. We don't have to ruminate here. We're not practicing rumination. We're practicing mindfully being in the moment with the breath, noticing the rise and fall, the impermanent nature of thought, releasing the solidification that coagulates around thoughts, just dissolving that back into the space from which they come. more of a letting go and uh, an unraveling than a doing. It's a letting be and a relaxing into a broader sense of space, a roominess. Let your meditation feel roomy, spacious. Now gently shifting into the next phase of practice of settling the mind in its natural state where we gently open the eyes if they're not open already and find a comfortable angle to rest the gaze gently towards the floor 
and then soften the eyes. We're practicing gaining familiarity and meditating with the eyes open. So don't stare at any one thing in particular, but soften the gaze. Let the gaze be vacant. As if you could see full 360 degrees around you. Relax the muscles behind the eyes. It can be helpful in the beginning to have a kind of a clear or uncluttered visual field, maybe looking out into space, the sky, a blank wall, floor, if possible but not required. And again, open to that feeling of roominess, of spacious domain within which thoughts arise and pass. So we're resting, we're familiarizing ourselves with resting in the nature of mind from the vantage point of spacious awareness rather than the vantage point, fused, coagulated in thought. So we pan back, lean back in your meditative internal space, broaden your vantage point and rest in awareness as if you were a fish suddenly aware of being in water. That water is your awareness. It's everywhere. It's always been present. It suffuses you. And I'll read some of the words from Machig's poem called Machig's Last Instructions. These are the teachings she gave right before she passed away. Let the mind rest in its natural expanse without any fabrication. When the bonds of negative thoughts are released, you will be free, there is no doubt. As when gazing into space, all other visual objects disappear, so it is for the mind itself. When mind looks at mind, when awareness looks at awareness, all discursive thoughts cease and enlightenment is attained. as in the clouds, in the sky. They disappear into the sky itself. Wherever they go, they go nowhere. 
wherever they are, they are nowhere. This is the same for thoughts in the mind. When awareness looks at awareness, the waves of conceptual thought disappear. defining characteristic of mind is to be primordially empty like space. The realization of the nature of mind includes all phenomena without exception. In meditation, abandon all bodily activities, rest in stillness, and remain like a bunch of straw cut loose. Abandoning all expressions of speech, remain like a lute with its strings cut through.
as in the sky all clouds disappear into the sky itself. Wherever they go, they go nowhere. Wherever they are, they are nowhere. This is the same for thoughts in the mind. When mind looks at mind, when awareness looks at awareness, the waves of conceptual thought disappear. Feel as if you're turning awareness to look back upon itself. As if you're feeling that outflow of the normal sensory pull to engage in the field of sensory stimuli. Turn that outflow back in upon itself. That energy turns back in and look. Who's there? Who's thinking? Who's meditating? Who's asking? And then release and rest in the experience brought about by the looking and the releasing and rest. You can do that a few times from time to time. Look and release and rest.
gently allow your eyes to close and rest the eyes. But maintain that quality of space, the quality of awareness. And really let go of any effort, if there's any remnant of that. And let yourself just be. being and presence, your natural state. as a closing prayer, heart prayer together, let's chant the six-syllable mantra of Om Mani Padme Hung. Om, universal sound of consciousness, Mani means jewel. Padme is in the lotus. Hung is the seed syllable of awakened mind. It can also mean to remember, like remembrance, to wake up. Om Mani Padme Hung is Om Jewel and the Lotus Hung. And maybe open your heart prayers to those in Ukraine and the surrounding areas and all beings who are suffering now. And we send this like a rainbow wisdom light from our hearts as we chant the mantra, enveloping the whole world in particular places in need, surrounding beings in protective rainbow light, bringing joy and release from suffering. Om Mani Padme Hum, Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme ho oh, 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 mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Oh mani padme hung Just 
the jewel in the heart of the lotus is the awakened mind, the bodhicitta, the Buddha nature, of love and compassion and wisdom. So we pray to that as we chant the mantra and we pray for compassion for all beings. And may all beings be free of suffering and harm. May they be safe. May they have joy in their lives. May they be free. May we all be free. Thank you. Thanks, Mace. You did it. <laughs> so this is a PDF that you can download. If you click on it, Mace just shared it. Um, so that's the poem, and I'll give commentary to the poem. You can print it out, download it, print it out if you want to, and use it in your practice. How is everybody? I see a note from Marianne saying you saw a big stone lion roaring. What's that? Tell me about that. As we were chanting? Or when you were meditating? It's amazing. Um, you can chat in, you know, how's it going? A couple words if you like, just to check in and connect with the field. I think I'll share my screen as I give a commentary to it. I can help you guys see it as we're doing it. Um, so I've got that ready. Lovely piece, Nick. Where are you texting in from, Nick? I can't remember where you're, where you're from. Are you San Francisco guy? I'm, I'm texting in from San Francisco, but I'm up in the Sierras now, so I'm extra chill. Extra chill. Great. Uh, Marianne, oh, when chanting, any significance? That's interesting. Um, it's hard to interpret. It's kind of like your dream, you know, I don't know. What does it mean to you? Roaring, this lion. Well, lions roar. The lion and the tiger symbolize uh, fearlessness in Buddhist iconography. Fearless, fearless of death, fearless. Um, the snow lion is an important animal in the Tibetan uh, high plateau and in their cultural uh, identity. Um, but roaring, it probably means there's a deep need and a sorrow, maybe, is my sense, especially if you were, you know, integrating the chant with prayers for peace. The heart roars, sorrow and love. Beautiful peace, thank you, Sherry. Beautiful, amazing spring night in Oregon, USA. So happy to be joining for the first time. Namaste. Welcome, Cindy. First time. Great. Yeah, it's nice that we can keep keep the meetings uh, both online and in person. So. Those of you who aren't in the area can keep coming. That's going to be good. The goodness that uh, sprouted in the COVID time can continue to grow. Yeah, Marianne, deep sorrow, deep love. Good. Okay, great. Okay, so good to see, see you guys coming in from all over. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And we can keep the theme of the meditation going. So if questions come up around the practice that we did in the context of the poem, please do chat 
or raise your hand and we can we can have discussion as well as we go along. So we are in chapter 11 of the book on the path to enlightenment which is on the nature of mind and I've decided to insert a, a additional extra credit poem here by a woman Machi Glavdrin cuz there's a dearth or an absence of uh, uh, women teachers in this book, unfortunately. So I wanted to bring that in and call that out. So I'm going to share my screen and teach on this. So can you see it? Thumbs up. Okay, great. So as I mentioned, these are her final instructions. Machig is for short, Machig Labdrun. Uh, Machig Labdrun, I can chat it, her full name. Machig, which means one mother. Lap or Labdrun, either way, it depends on how you phoneticize the Tibetan, which means the, the, the lamp of Lap. Drun is lamp. lamp. Machig Labdrun. Uh, she, her exact dates aren't, oh, it's like 10, 45 to 10, 10, 10, Sometimes people say, either they say she lived to be 90 or 99, but so she, we say she's around the 11th century. Medieval Tibet. <laughs> Which was a very rich time there. It was a time of renaissance of rebirth renaissance uh, dharma in tibet it had kind of died off because of uh, uh, one particular but different events but one particular king uh, who was wanted to revive the indigenous tradition of the bun and other shamanic traditions in tibet which is an interesting story actually uh Usually we only hear it told from the Buddhist perspective. It'd be nice to hear, you know, more from the Bun tradition as well, what their perspective was of that. But he didn't want Dharma to flourish in, in Tibet, so he kind of made it illegal. And it was, a, I think it degenerated and kind of lost favor for a couple hundred years. And then it came back with the king uh, Trisong Datsen around the 11th century, inviting... Uh, great masters from India to Tibet to revive Dharma. And so Machi Glavdrin was living and teaching around that time. And she actually came into contact with one of the great teachers from India of that time, Padampa Sangye, who some, some, some legends say he was Bodhidharma, who brought Buddhism to China. But it's hard to prove that. In any case, he was quite a wild, wandering yogin practitioner, tantric Buddhist practitioner. And he taught Machig and supported her and actually really validated her, saying, you will be a great teacher. You need to share your dharma. And uh, like I said, she's also a contemporary of the great um, yogi saint Milarepa, who was well known for his songs of realization. That would be a fun study group. A uh, book group would be to read her work and also Milarepa's and Padampa Sangye's teachings. All of them are fabulous. Uh, so Machi Glavdrin, in the 11th century, she, you can find this poem in a number of different places, but this particular translation is from... Um, Jerome Edu's book, Machi Glavdrin and the Foundations of Chud. Machi Glavdrin and the Foundations of Chud. I'll just write that, get that out of the way. Machi by Jerome Edu. So you can find that in Dharma stores, Dharma bookstores online and in person probably. So this poem is in that book and um, it's actually published by Snow Lion, Marianne <laughs> Publishing, which had got swallowed into Shambhala Publishing nowadays. So in any case, 
here is this poem. And she's really pointing out the nature of mind. These are her final instructions given before she died. I believe it was her son who asked her to give final instructions. And so she gave them to her family and her students. And this is really meant to cut through any extra and go right to the source. And it can be a meditative manual, like a way you read it and then practice it, read it and practice it, and that's why I read it to you. So she wrote, she said, in the same way, mind itself. Now, I didn't read all of this to you in the meditation, so some of this will be kind of new. In the same way, so this is a continuation, it's a longer poem, but my teacher chose to make an excerpt and just focus on this part of the poem. So you can often in, in Buddhist texts, you know, if they're saying in the same way, that means that there was something happening before. <laughs> and now we are building on that. So in the same way, mind itself has no support, has no object. Let it rest in its natural expanse without any fabrication. So let's pause there. She's not just saying mind. She's saying mind itself, and that's intentional. Mind itself is a very specific Dharma term that differentiates its, it itself from regular mind. So what she's talking about is the nature of mind, your own rigpa, your own pristine awareness. So the term in Tibetan is sem nyit, N-Y-I-D, sem, S-E-M, then N-Y-I-D, sem nyit. And nyit is a, like a reflexive, um, like a suffix that can be tagged on at the end of any word. And it kind of points back to itself. So mind itself. Um, sem ni. So mind itself, it's like highlighting the special mind, the, the, the ultimate mind. As opposed to discursive, ruminating mind, vikalpa, which is just sem the dualistic mind that clings to objects out there is real, thoughts is solid, self is real, and so on. This mistaken perception is kind of the function of the mundane mind. So we're not talking about the mundane mind. The mundane mind, and remember, they're all within us, these, the ultimate and the relative level, like the sun and its rays. It's not that they're separate, but it's not that they're the same like the sun and its rays. You understand? So the rays come from the sun, but they're not the same as the sun. Just like mind, sem, comes from sem ni, mind itself, the source, but it's not the same as it, but it's not different. And so we're, we're tracing the light rays back, the sun rays back to the sun, mind itself. That ultimate nature of mind has no support, has no object. It's not, you can't find it anywhere. You might peel back the layers of your skull or your being. You can't find, it doesn't have a support, like a foundation to a, a house. It doesn't have also like reified objects out there. There's nothing out there that, that it perceives ultimately as an object. You could also say like, it's not a subject, it's not an object. And then the instruction is to let it rest in its natural expanse without any fabrication. So fabrication, this is a very important term in Dharma and in Dzogchen and in Mahamudra. So we're really learning Dharma for the most part throughout most of our teachings, especially what's coming through in this book on the path to enlightenment that we're studying here from more of the Dzogchen, the Great Perfection lens, which is a very important and beautiful practice lineage of Tibet that is even amongst the different lineages, say, they say that it's the, the pinnacle. It's, it's the most kind of essence. And so in Dzogchen, as well as Mahamudra, which is very similar to Dzogchen, Mahamudra, Fabrication is an interesting technical term. It's ch in Tibetan, ch with a long ending, not ch like to cut, 
ch, c-h-o, umlaut, s is silent at the end. Ch means to fabricate, to make, to construct. And when you are resting in meditation, if you're busy fabricating things, thoughts, memories, fantasies, uh, solutions to problems, uh, you are not in meditation. You are thinking. You are in the discursive mind. You are in sem, not semni. And so she's saying, let the mind rest in its natural expanse without any fabrication. You could say, let the mind itself. In any case, let your exp- let yourself rest in that experience of the natural expanse. And uh, without any fabrication. And the Tibetan word for without fabrication is ma chu, without fabricating. Ma chu. Ma's negative chu is to fabricate. So without fabricating. And what is the natural expanse? Well, the, the term is long, L O N G, but it's not like long, it's more like long. And uh, the natural expanse is this, it's like space. It's like that expansive space of the mind that we keep directing you towards in your meditation. So you let your mind, you let awareness rest in this natural expansiveness, this release, the roominess, without fabricating, without tying yourself up in knots and constricting and getting claustrophobic in that vast space. And then she says, when the bonds of negative thoughts are ceased, that's the tying up into knots, right? When we're tied up in knots, we're kind of suffering. It's knots of suffering. When those can unravel, when those bonds of no- negative thoughts are just naturally released, we don't have to like work hard to untie them. In fact, you know, if you freak out, then they get even tighter. <laughs> right? It's like trying to escape from a complex knot. You know, you have to relax and release and find the space and let it unravel. So when the bonds of negative thoughts are released, you will be free, there is no doubt. You will feel that sense of freedom. And she has confidence in that. So we can we can lean into her confidence. We can adopt and borrow some of her confidence. Okay, yeah, you think that's true? Okay, we'll, we'll try it. Then she says, as gazing into space, all other visual ap- objects appear, disappear. As gazing into space, all other visual objects disappear. So I didn't direct you to really gaze up into space, which is actually the more common way, but it's quite advanced, you know, raising the gaze, but you can play with it. Like raising the gaze to just above the horizon is the classic instruction. But you can also do it by gazing slightly downwards. In any case, there's something that happens that's very important when the eyes are open. It's a different uh, quality of awareness that comes. And it's not that it's better, but for this particular meditation, try to do it with the eyes open because it brings about this quality of space and this non-duality of the inner and the outer. As long as the eyes are closed, we can feel like, oh, I'm nice and inside. But when the eyes are open, it's like that feeling of the, the dissolving of the boundary between the inner life and the outer life, the inner perception and the outer perception. And really, as we rest in awareness, we are suffusing our experience with space and breaking down those boundaries, even if it's just a feeling. You know, we're not literally dissolving. So because we gaze into space, all that the solidity of everything that you're seeing, like your glass case or a plate or a cup, like those objects, they lose, we're not fixating on them. So she's saying the visual field, it's almost like um, it begins to vibrate with luminosity. You know, It's not like you're hallucinating. You're just not reifying the visual field, the visual perceived objects as solid things anymore. It's not not within your it's not what you're doing with the meditation. So you're you're resting in awareness and a dog, a cat could come and 
or a bird could fly through, and it doesn't shake you, it doesn't rattle you. She says, so just like visual objects disappear, so it is for the mind itself. Meaning, um, when mind looks at mind, all discursive thoughts cease and enlightenment is attained. Uh, One other way of translating it is when awareness looks at awareness. And some people find that a little bit easier to feel. Uh, It's like when when your attention focuses back in upon itself. You know, in a sense, it's true. As meditators, we, we understand we can we can observe the mind, right? So there's this broader awareness that can observe thoughts. This broader awareness that can observe feelings. So that's that it's that broader awareness that's doing the looking. You know, it's that broader when broader awareness looks at awareness or when broader awareness looks at the mind. But simply put, when mind looks at mind or when um, awareness looks at awareness, there's something, it, in a sense, it kind of arrests the projection, the, the vomiting of <laughs> rumination that's always flowing out. We're kind of going against the tide, and then it cancels that flow out, right? So if it's always moving in one direction, if we look, then it can cancel it out, and it pauses, whew, and discursive thoughts cease, and enlightenment is attained. I mean, well, what does that mean? Okay, that means you rest in your nature of mind and you grok it. It's kind of a big statement there. Um, liberation from the bondage of dualistic thinking, you could say, is attained. I mean, what is enlightenment? That's a whole it's a, a big discussion. But really, enlightenment, depending on what tradition you're in, is the cessation of the vikalpa, of the fluctuations of the mind. So that you can rest in your home ground, which is the nature of mind. Samnyi, your mind itself. Rigpa, awareness. Buddha nature. These are all different vocabulary words pointing to the same thing. Enlightenment, Buddhahood. So one analogy the Lama Tsultra makes is that, you know, if you're, a, if you're in a boat going down a river, then you're going down with the current, and there's momentum there. That's like the feeling of our projections, like our eyes, our nose, our taste, hearing, touch. All of these sensory experiences are used to going out to make contact into the world, right? So there's this natural outflow, like the f- river flowing the water flowing downstream, and the boat flowing on that river, this natural momentum. But what happens when that boat that's going downstream turns back with its motor or its sail and starts to flow back up? That river, it in a sense, it can, you know, if it's strong, it can reverse all the way and go back to the port or the source, but also there's this quality or the feeling of a canceling out. It could st- it could idle in a still space. And that's the feeling, is like when mind turns to look at mind, there's a pause. There's this pause to the knee-jerk reaction of projecting outwards all the time, and that's when you re- rest in mind itself, nature of mind. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about it, it's something that you need to experience. You really practice. Uh, maybe you tasted it already. This is an additional technique that we haven't really been teaching in these nature of mind meditations. Uh, I wanted to bring this in because it's very, it's, it's got some yin and yang to it. You know, it's simultaneously active and effortful. And then you release and you rest in the experience that comes about after looking. So you're not looking the whole time. That's too much yang. It's too much effort. You look and release and rest. That could be your mantra. From time to time, especially if you notice you're distracted, use that distraction as fuel, like the river flow. Turn it back in upon itself and look, release, and rest. It's like... You know, in massage, the, the, the idea with the muscles and the tissues is you squeeze the tissues and then you soak. It, it, then they, you squeeze and release. And what that does is it squeezes the fluids out of the tissues. And then when you release, 
the fluids come back in and soak the tissues with more uh, refreshed blood and lymph. You know, things are flowing and moving. And for me, you know, I'm not a massage therapist, but I have a lot of friends who do it. I've received a lot of massages. <laughs> But I'm also a you know, trained yoga teacher. We learn the value of pressure and circulation and touch and adjustment and hands on and this quality of squeeze and soak, also just through our movements, right? Jogging or moving, yoga, whatever is a squeeze and soak. And that's why we feel so good usually after we do it. And this is like that. It's like you squeeze when you look, you kind of hone in and focus the attention and like more of a laser, like look at mind. What do you find? Do you find anything? And then release. We assume there's something here called the mind, but when you look, you can't find it. You can't find it. But then you're here. So what's that? That's what they say you might even, when you look and release, you might even identify awareness. You might for yourself taste rikpa. So there is some, there's, if, if you find a quality of awareness, of presence, of luminosity, like a, know, a quality of knowing in, imbued with like a light, you know, like a clarity and a luminosity, then you might have just started to taste the nature of your own mind. You know, so stabilize in that. In some teachings, they say, look and like see. Do you see? Is, is the, does the mind have color, shape, location, texture? Like, can you really, like, oh yeah, there's mini me in there. <laughs> I found her. No, can't find it. But what's there? There's a wakefulness. That's the nature, that's, that's the, the mind itself. That's why she says enlightenment is attained when, you, when, dis, when all the discursive thoughts that cloud over that luminosity, when those subside, what remains is the sun, the light. And that, so that is revealed. And then as in the sky, all clouds disappear in the sky itself. Wherever they go, they go nowhere. Wherever they are, they are nowhere. This is the same for thoughts in the mind. When mind looks at mind, the waves of conceptual thought disappear. So this squeeze and soak method of looking and releasing actually helps to calm the waves of conceptual ideation. The ocean of the mind gets more calm. It might not have gotten more calm this first time, or it might have. You know, if you didn't feel more calm this first time, don't panic. It's fine. You know, you just might have gotten introduced to this for the first time ever in your whole life. You might be a longtime meditator and b never had this experience before. So give us some time. Maybe, or maybe some of you got it. Like, I get it. So regardless, we've got to always, no matter what technique we're doing, we've got to always come fresh to each session and not assume it's going to be like your last session. So come fresh, come like a beginner's mind to each session, but try this again and again. As much as you can, stabilize in it, mature in it, make it your own. Uh, the defining characteristic of mind is to be primordially empty like space. The realization of the nature of mind includes all phenomena without exception. So nothing is left out in, in awareness, right? It's all welcome. Like, yeah, it's sure, early on conceptual ideation can, can, can quiet down when we're achieving samadhi, meditative concentration. But at the same time, we are in the world. We're not going to die or go to another solar system where we're here in our body. And so we include all phenomena without exception. Awareness is like the space that pervades everything. So everything is included. That's why it's primordially empty like space. So empty, and we're not talking about like empty, like void necessarily. Um, empty is more like a quality of 
space. Like it's, um, it's uh, not solid. It's empty of intrinsic existence, empty of solidity. Usually empty, when you hear empty in Buddhism, think of it as like a quality, like a quality of phenomenon. Like all appearances are empty of solidity. That's emptiness. Thoughts are empty of concrete, you know, reality. They appear, but they're empty. They're empty of solidity. Just like wetness is to water, emptiness is to phenomena. It's a quality of existence. So it's and from the very beginning, from beginningless time. Even the Buddha said, I looked on my, my enlightenment, the evening of my enlightenment, I looked back to find my the first life, the beginning, couldn't find it. So after a while I said, okay, well let's look forward. Saw infinite lives moving forward, couldn't find the end, end point. And so he came back and said, right now is the most important moment to focus on. Okay, so almost done here. These last two stanzas. Once discursive thoughts are totally abandoned, dharmakaya is none other than that. Which she's talking about primordially, you know, the primordial nature of mind. So once discursive thoughts are totally abandoned, dharmakaya is none other than that. Once the five poisons are totally abandoned, the five wisdoms are none other than that. So, the first two lines. When we've stopped reifying our conceptual ideation, our discursive thoughts, when we abandon them, bong is the word in Tibetan, like let them go, we just turn away, we let them, drop them, we drop them, <laughs> drop it. <laughs> or like I said, cut it loose, right? Dharmakaya is none other than that. Dharma kaya. Dharma is phenomena, reality, truth. Kaya means dimension or body. And so dharmakaya is a very interesting dharma word, which means the truth body, or the ultimate dimension, you could say. And it's a, it's a, a, it's another term for Buddha nature, or mind itself. So she's saying, if you know, I'd like to see the Tibetan here, but it's a little awkward, this translation. Um, the, the writer was French, and I sometimes I wonder if his translation <laughs> English wasn't his first language, but it's it's good nonetheless, good enough. Um, but basically, when you dis, d- dissolve or abandon all discursive thoughts, what shines through is dharmakaya. We land on it. That's essentially what they're saying, what Machig is saying. And then, once the five poisons are totally abandoned. The five wisdoms are none other than that. I mean, that could be a whole class in and of itself, too. And for those of you who are familiar with the the mandala and the five Buddha family of the mandala structure, it's like the tantric Buddhist medicine wheel in a way. You have the center and then the four uh, peripheral, the quadrants, like uh, north, south, east, west. And they all, each direction houses... um, are said to house different Buddha fields, and within those Buddha fields, you have different qualities, different wisdoms. It's like a it's like a template for the psyche to rest on. It's a psychic template uh, for awakening and integration. And then you've learned if you learn about the mandala, you learn about the five poisons and the five wisdoms. But you don't need to learn about these through the mandala. But it's actually an easier way, isn't it, Pamela? Like an easy way to remember the things because you've got the architecture of it. So uh, five poisons are the classic three, which are ignorance, the root, poison, hatred, and craving. Yeah, these are in all the different streams of Buddhism. And then you also have two more in different teachings, kind of to elucidate, but really you have a ton of things that can grow out of these original three. But the additional two are um, arrogant pride, or you could say conceit. And then the fifth is jealousy or competitiveness, 
which is interesting because both of those are really kind of predicated on not being good enough, you know, not feeling good enough, you know, either when we don't feel good enough, we're either com- we're petty and jealous, or on the other side of the spectrum, we are, we puff up with arrogant pride and try to make ourselves seem better than we really are. Or, you know, we make up for our insecurity. We're all better than we think we are, actually. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, we're all better than we think we are, I think it's safe to say. <laughs> That's the premise of Buddhism. You got Buddha nature in there, you just forgot it. You're better than you think you are. <laughs> That's the good news. So once the five poisons are totally abandoned, when you've abandoned those five poisons, then what happens is the five wisdoms fill their place. And the five wisdoms are, you know, if you're talking about ignorance, the root poison, that transmutes or transforms or heals into the wisdom of suchness, meaning the understanding of the nature of reality. If we're talking about the poison of hatred or aggression, when that's healed, integrated, transmuted, when or when you abandon, here she uses the, they will use the word abandon. So, but really, I like to use more inclusive wording and less like cutting things out, but actually like bringing them home and integrating and healing them. Then when hatred is brought home and healed or not fed in this way, that gives rise to the wisdom that is like a clear seeing, a mirror-like wisdom. When the poison of conceit is abandoned or integrated or healed, that gives rise to, um, they say, the wisdom of equanimity. You're, you're not, you're grounded, you know, you one taste. You, you, can, you can be in the world with its pleasures and sorrows and still be, you know, hold your ground and be a refuge for others. When the poison of desire or clinging or craving is abandoned or healed, integrated that gives rise to the wisdom called all discerning wisdom it's like you see things in all of their beautiful differences and similarities you can discern very well you're discerning when the poison the last one of jealousy or competitiveness is abandoned or healed that gives rise to the all accomplishing wisdom meaning everything's already perfect and everything's already done you don't have to compete or, you know, be a workaholic. Uh, it's a deep wisdom, that one. Not an easy one to, uh, to abide in, but when it hits, you understand it. Like, oh, in some way, everything is already perfect. How can we do our work, but also holding that, trusting that, the work will get done, or in some parallel universe, it's already done. <laughs> so that's that's kind of a truncated teaching on the five poisons becoming the five wisdoms. It's a deep teaching, and it's very essential to Dharma. And then, lastly, this is more like how to. This last this last stanza is like this is what you do when you meditate, abandoning all bodily activities, remain like a bunch of straw cut loose. So this is the body just, you know, if it was a bundle of straw like they can do, you know, where it's just a bunch of straw and then around the middle it's tied with string. And if you imagine cutting that string and the bundle of straw just goes, it just settles. So that's like the body. We just relax into that natural feeling of, not a floppiness, a nice alignment with gravity, but not ten- dense, tense and dense. So they say re- abandon all bodily activities also means like you don't have to do prostrations anymore. <laughs> you don't have to do cora or circumambulations anymore. <laughs> yeah, I can see Pamela likes that one. You don't have to do all that exercise and yoga and hard work to purify your body. You're already perfect. It's already done. <laughs> 
and abandon all bodily activities, at least in the context of this style of meditation, we're not moving. We are still. You know, of course, it's important to move and squeeze and soak your tissues and get your circulation going. Yes, but we're talking about this Dzogchen style of nature of mind meditation. Don't move. Abandon. Itching. Adjusting. Fixing. You know, you've got to be still. Why? Because when the body's still, the mind gets still. Not complicated. Abandoning all expressions of speech, remain like a lute with its strings cut through. I personally love this image. It's really cool. It's like, oh, it's not, we're not picking at this, you know, the strings aren't sounding. I love music. It's not, I don't, we don't have anything about against music, but we don't have to talk. We don't even have to recite mantra or prayers. Just rest in silence. Remain like a lute with its strings cut through. Again, nothing to do. You don't have to fabricate. You don't have to fix. You don't have to make yourself better. You don't have to engage in the perpetual self-improvement project. Rest. So this is the, from the Life Story of Machi Glavdran by Kung Pong Sundru Senge from the 13th century, folios 445 to 457, translated by Jerome Edu, uh, Machi Glavdran and the Foundations of Chu. Wonderful book. It's on page 165 to 170, the whole poem. So it's one of my first books I read about Machi. There are many more nowadays. But there you've got that. And here you go. Now it's yours, and now you get to take it on the road. <laughs> take it to your cushion. Yeah, roominess. I know, Marianne, you got it too. I love Rumi. It, when I heard when Rumi came to me, I was like, Rumi, <laughs> feel, bring him in. But yeah, roominess. Uh, so Lindsay, I love this description of active and rest. The first thing I thought of is surfing. Nice. Momentum on the wave. When you're lucky, you release and the wave takes you. You're watching yourself, the wave, but also totally releasing yourself to the wave. This made it so much sense for me. Yes, beautiful. That's a great analogy. Yeah, I've, I've surfed a bit and I, I get what you're saying. It's a beautiful thing. And it's very true. Anyone else? Maybe in another minute or two? Questions, comments? Uh, she, she's brilliant. Hmm? I think she's brilliant. Yeah, she is. Really, and I, I can just imagine her on the Tibetan plateau gazing out into the sky. And what type, what atmosphere must she have had to develop this mind? Yeah. She had a beautiful uh, monastery, actually, in her later years. She established her seat at a place called Zangri Kangmar, which means the land of the copper mount, uh, hill. Oh, Zangri, right. Zangri, copper mountain, Kangmar with the red house and the copper mountain. But it was right by a river. I haven't been. Lama Tsultrim and some of her other students went, and it looks beautiful. But I always picture her there sometimes when I read these poems. The expansiveness, yeah, the sky. Sky was really important in the Tibetan kind of collective unconscious, too. I mean, it's just, they're at the rooftop of the world. Yeah. Has anybody been to Tibet? No. I've been to Ladakh. Yeah, similar feeling. In that area, which borders on it. And I remember one night being stuck in this area and looking up at the sky and I'd never seen a sky, have never seen a sky ever like that sky. Mm. And this was, you know, probably 12, 13,000 feet up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so vast. That expanse, right? The long, the long chen means a great expanse. 
So whenever you go out, go on a hike, and we love, a lot of us love hiking, sit down for five or 10 minutes and do this practice. Get out on a mountaintop or a hillside where you can get as much of an unobstructed view, even in the city or in the East Bay where I am. Find those places, even just uh, sitting and even just five minutes of releasing into space, resting the mind in the expanse of the sky. It, then, then you'll feel connected with her like you would if you were in Tibet. Paul, you've been three times to Lhasa and Mount Kailash. I didn't know that about you. That's wonderful. Yeah, what was the sky like, Laura asks. Just amazingly clear, and it's like you could reach up and touch the stars because there's such a lack of industry, of course, that there's no pollution. Yeah. So it's just wide open space, just amazingly beautiful. Mm. That's great. I've never uh, been to Lhasa, but I went to Eastern Tibet, so I've had a taste of it. But Eastern Tibet, you know, it doesn't have that same kind of like high desert, high plateau feeling as the Western, Central and Western Tibet does. Um, so thank you, yeah, for sharing. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, Mace has reposted the Donna. Please do consider giving what you can. Every little bit um, adds up. And I'm excited to hear how it goes with Eve on next week. She'll teach on the 30th, and then I'll come back the week after, probably online. I will try to get in person as much as I can, but we'll let you know ahead of time for that, too. Thank you, everybody. Have a good uh, good week. Uh, keep going with the book. We'll start to read the chapter on the hermit. You know, Eve might want to do a couple of these last poems or she might want to jump right into the next chapter. I'll leave that up to her. But So we're 11, 12 cusp here. You can read ahead if you want to. Thank you. Good to see you. Be well, everyone. Thank you so much for reading.